um, in my talk, I won't focus too much on, on the aspects of my experience in, you know, going through change and <laughs> trying to, uh, to drive some of that change. But um, I'm really looking forward to sharing that in the panel if there's a chance. So I'm going to share my screen um, and I'll say a couple of words about myself. So, you know, where I'm coming from. So um, I, I'm a computational linguist by background, uh, but um, I, I actually studied classics and mathematics, um, two separate degrees, because at the time um, I didn't know a way to combine um, the two. And then I discovered computational linguistics for my PhD. Uh, and then in recent years, I moved um, more towards um, digital humanities, but also still staying in within um, analysis of, of, of language. And I had a, a, also some years in industry in an academic publishing. And so you'll see that in some of my slides. And also um, I was um, in working for Oxford Dictionaries for a few years, trying to actually uh, um, inspire a little bit of change in, in lexicography. And that went in, 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 uh, in, in it was a, you know, a, a really interesting and a, a learning experience. I can share that as well. Um, so my talk is going to be based on, on, on the experience that I gathered in the last sort of 15 years, so to speak. Um, a, and I thought about organizing it around kind of different pillars or different aspects that are what I see as part of computational approaches in the humanities. So um, obviously uh, we, we, um, you know, we had not inventing <laughs> in some way anything new in the sense that we have a long tradition of humanistic scholarship that has produced you know, collected data for centuries. And um, but the, the the medium and and the uh, you know, the data sparsity comes uh, context in which uh, people were operating back then meant that in a way that shaped the the way scholarship could be done. Uh, and uh, as we all know, in recent years with the big digitization uh, projects, we we things have changed radically. Not just because we have access to more data, but because this has forced us to um, articulate the way we we analyze the data and, in a way, rethink uh, the way we we can do scholarship. Which with you know, with some successes and some you know some opposition, as we heard in the previous talk, and um, so there are different ways of, of relating. The computational kind of data inspired um, methodologies with the realm of, of the humanities. And um, I can, can see the four main ones. I mean, there are many, but uh, the ones I can tend to focus on and what my talk will focus on around uh, the, 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 the question how can we automate and scale up tasks in humanities research? So, how can we really embed computational thinking? Uh, in asking humanities um, really related uh, research questions. Uh, but of course we can uh, in experience this interaction uh, between these two fields in other ways. For example, there's you know, the people who are looking into philosophy and critics of data science. So looking at data science from, yes, philosophical, but also historical point of view and critical. Um, there is also a, a whole group uh, you know, people working on computational creativity and the art side of the humanities. Um, and then there's, of course, a group, a group of people um, uh, uh, working in you know, cultural heritage uh, institutions, for example, working with them, um, who are interested also in the infrastructural aspects. And all of these, of course, work together. Um, but just to keep things manageable, um, my focus will be on, on the, on the kind of four, first um, topic that I mentioned. And it is an area that has, is gathering increasing interest. Um, so we have, uh, you know, we've had uh, you know, events and uh, workshops and conferences being organized in the past at least 10 years, but, uh, you know, of course, <laughs> uh, we, we had a lot, a much longer tradition of humanities and computing, uh, but, you know, events that have computational humanities in their title. Um, we have, for example, the um, 
Computational Humanities Research Conference. Uh, this is now in its uh, third year. Uh, we have uh, groups, networks uh, of, um, of people at this space. Of course, there are many. I'll just mention the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, so the uh, Humanities and Science uh, group that I founded at the Alan Turing Institute, which is uh, the UK National Institute for, for Data Science and AI. So it was an interesting uh, case of bringing humanists into a data science institute rather than the other way around. Um, we have um, uh, we also have publications, of course, in the space, and um, there's also there are also projects and money going into this type of research. I just mentioned the one I am directly part of. It's called Living with Machines. It's a nine um, million project funded um, at the Alan Turing Institution at British Library. So it was big investment uh, from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to uh, for a project that looked um, and is looking at um, the effect of mechanization around the Industrial Revolution uh, on, on, on lives of ordinary people at, at the time, uh, using data science and, and history together. And um, so um, definitely there is an increased amount of interest, but you know, as we said, as we saw in the previous talk, it isn't without friction um, in the humanities as well as in the social sciences space. And I also did my share in writing a white paper. Um, this was um, together with uh, about 25 other people from the Turing group. And I wanted to just mention this because it, it mirrors nicely what Krista said of, of her uh, at, on her side. I mean, in, in our, our experience was um, it was, was, was positive in, in the sense that the paper had got um, kind of impacts, academic impact, also uh, you know, was picked up by the Economist. Um, interviewed me in 2019, uh, and it keeps being referred to. But in terms of its real impact, it's been much slower and much less radical than uh, one might have in a, uh, envisaged. So it is uh, proof that change is is really hard. But um, but things are happening, and um, there's definitely uh, both a bottom up and a top down. Uh, movement so from the top uh, in the UK but also of course well beyond an, an European level and, and well beyond uh, yeah, we do see increased funding in this space um, under the bottom up we do see increased you know, number of people uh, active in this space but there are, you know, the, the, there are challenges of course there. so what uh, what does this computational thinking actually look like and so I, I thought of breaking it up into uh, into different pillars because we call I call them pillars. And um, so one aspect of it is really the quantitative side. Uh, so um, I called it quantitative thinking, but also doing um, because there's a lot of doing uh, involved, but also a lot of thinking. And uh, what I mean by this is. Um, that um, so I, I as I said I'm a linguist by background and I basically noticed that uh, they can recognize and uh, sort of standard way of, of reporting um, research and kind of um, articulating analysis in historical linguist, uh, linguistics was looking a little bit like this example where you have a phenomenon uh, for example this uh, Latin word here and then uh, the researcher is trying to articulate um, a quantitative argument but using a language that isn't uh, directly quantitative so you see you know you got this um, Word that is attested you know, as a, as a neuter in old languages, but we have some exceptions in this author and this other author uh, where it also occurs in in a different gender. Okay, so you you got a bit of variation here. So my instinct would be, well, how can you quantify it? But the, I wasn't seeing this much in kind of standard state of the art literature, and I called this the example based approach because I could see. Examples being used uh, to illustrate a phenomenon and to kind of show evidence of a gen more general pattern. But what I was missing is the quantification aspect. Um, um, another, so it's a question like, you know, how were the examples selected? You know, what, what made them worth uh, mentioning? Also, how, you know, how can this be reproduced? Um, you know, what, what would other people looking at this phenomenon uh, conclude? Uh, another thing that I noticed um, was the challenges of dealing with multivariate phenomena. So 
in linguistics and in many other, other fields, we have um, phenomena that, of course, come from a variety of different, I have a variety of different dimensions. So we can have, for example, a grammatical uh, feature, but we also have a stylistic, um, a stylistic context, a register, a, a genre context, a geo, uh, geographical context, and, and, and of course, a chronological context, and so on. So again, I was seeing this not captured in qualitative terms that weren't quite um, uh, to my satisfaction, so to speak. Um, so not to put, put, put these authors on the spot, these are very good scholars, but I took their uh, quotations just to show the, the, the idea that, yes, we, we do see this attempt and it's, it wasn't quite uh, what I was hoping to see. Uh, and so um, once, you know, after observing all of this, um, so with, uh, with my colleague, uh, Jan said, we wrote this book back in 2017 uh, with Oxford University Press, Quantitative Historical Linguistics, a Corpus Framework. And what we thought is, well, um, there is a need maybe to help um, historical linguists kind of find their way in this quantitative uh, landscape because there is a definite interest and and the but the the situation is 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 um is a is a kind of yeah in a, in a way that interesting stage so this is a visualization of what we called uh, the chasm model it's taken from marketing and it's the idea that when a new new technology is introduced um it goes through different phases because different groups of people adopt it at different points so you've got the early majority the innovators and early adopters that adopt it straight away then you've got a chasm that separates them from the rest where you have the early majority late majority and finally the skeptics that eventually adopt the same month technology. So we sort of quantifying the state of historical linguistics according to this model. So we looked at 69 papers published in historical linguistics and we categorized them based on whether they were qualitative or quantitative and also whether they were, they were corpus based or not. So by corpus based we meant that they used a corpus, so a collection of texts, as their primary evidence source um, and um, so not just examples but you know kind of bit more systematic analysis and then uh, of course quantitative versus qualitative was the other dimension and what we saw is that historical linguistics actually ha had at the time um, a higher proportion of um, of qualitative uh, versus quantitative papers and of not corpus based versus corpus based uh, papers and um, that was interesting compared to the general linguistics um, case where um, the, the situation was reversed. So we had a higher proportion of quantitative papers. This was from a study that um, uh, researcher Samson did on uh, looking at articles published in language, which is uh, the kind of, uh, flagship journal for general linguistics. So um, we actually really, really have done, <laughs> we've done this study again, uh, a few years later, and the results um, you know, have shifted a bit. So historical linguistic has moved more towards quantitative, um, but still uh, still lagging behind. And so we thought there is room for um, make a contribution that um, can, can kind of try and fill this gap, uh, methodologically uh, more than kind of practically. And so just to see, we give you a quick example of what we mean by um, this quantitative framework before going into the actual framework. This was um, a phenomenon that we looked at in a, in a case study. So it's the alternation between has and has as, as uh, forms of the verb um, of, of have in English. And um, there's been a change, but there's also the two forms can actually occur together. So this is a quote from Shakespeare, where you can see both uh, forms. So uh, historical linguists have been asking the question, you know, how did this shift happen? Because nowadays we say has, but in the past it was actually, you know, in the 16. Uh, 1500s, it was actually uh, much more frequently used. Um, so this shift happened over time, and this is uh, the, the distribution that we can actually plot because we have annotated data covering this period for English, but it is a complex multidimensional multivariate phenomenon. And so we adopted a multivariate analysis 
technique, uh, particularly uh, in this case was a, um, a logistic regression model that uh, looked at um, this alternation uh, between half and has, um, and looked at different factors might have affected this alternation, like well, the context, the linguistic context, so, so whether um, so what type of, of, of verb it was, the uh, so the, the, the kind of phonological context, um, the, the the gender of the of the speaker, because we know females writers well, female speakers you know, known for being you know, particularly innovative. So was that you know was that true? Um, the you know frequency effects, uh, etc. And so we looked at all these variables, and we were able to quantify them directly. So that is the kind of analysis that we were trying to uh, argue for, uh, because we do have a combination of purely linguistic, extra linguistic um, factors, and you know, in normally uh, in traditional historical linguistics, these factors are accounted for, but on an, on an ad hoc uh, basis and um, on a kind of case by case example uh, basis. In a qualitative uh, way, um, so um, so what we thought was well, we we don't really need, well, uh, we don't we don't want to be uh, showing um, ex con concrete examples only. We would like to create a framework that um, is more future proof um, and can kind of uh, map the research workflow in historical linguistics in a um, corpus quantitative. Uh, way. And so we came up with um, uh, a whole terminology that was actually uh, inspired by uh, work by Carrier and uh, into an earlier, a few years uh, earlier. And uh, we talked about claims as being kind of the core um, aim of, of our, in, in this case, quantitative historical linguistics. So the idea of, of making claims are supported by evidence. And in fact, the evidence can be of different types of different strengths. And there is a probabilistic um, kind of foundation uh, to, to these strengths. And, and so we, we map the whole process from historical linguistic reality, which is lost because we don't know what people sounded like, what they spoke like, but we do have written evidence that is kind of approximate of that. Um, in, so we talk, we start from the evidence, we go through process of enriching the evidence with annotation that allows us to kind of, uh, tease out uh, the different uh, features going on. And then we have a quantitative evidence that can be um, then uh, the basis for um, testing uh, hypotheses and, and then building uh, models. So. Uh, in a nutshell, this is what we um, we proposed, and um, and then we thought, well, this is um, uh, proposed for historical linguistics. So a couple of years of years later, I uh, collaborated with um, Tobias Blanke um, and uh, John Wilson, but we also uh, gave a talk with uh, Giovanni Colavizza. So they came from a historical background, and we thought, can we adapt this framework? It for uh, to history and can we change it so that it actually fits uh, the needs of historians? Um, and so, uh, of course, there are, there are similarities between historical linguists and linguists and historians because we, uh, you know, we're dealing with historical reality, but with also big differences. And so, the result was an ad adaptation of the of the model where, uh, you know, we uh, changed a few things and we started working on it and we started kind of testing it on different um, uh, scenarios. Um, and so um, my, our conclusion was, well, there's more work to do, definitely. And there's broader scope for, in history. There's kind of a different set of evidence sources, different balance of, of evidence, um, and um, maybe also smaller scope for purely quantitative approaches in history. But there's definitely room for that. And so, so that was encouraging because of it, you know, thought, okay, we can go beyond um, our home in the historical linguistics. And so having said what I mean by quantitative thinking, the other pillar that I have in mind is what I call algorithmic thinking or computational thinking and doing, of course. Um, so that was, um, that is builds on, but is also separate from the quantitative um, aspect. So I, that brings me to my first book, um, um, where um, uh, we talk about methods in Latin computation linguistics. And the idea of this book was 
not just to uh, show lat uh, Latin linguists what uh, com computational linguistics can do, but also to rethink um, computational linguistics so that it actually works to, for the features of, of Latin, which is a dead uh, language with a very, very long uh, time span and uh, you know, rich morphology and all these features that are quite different from the modern languages for which is the computational linguistics has been developed. And so um, how can this computational thinking apply to, for example, a very um, kind of well-known case, uh, that of lexicography? I, I worked for Oxford Dictionaries. I have a bit of a, of a sweet spot for, uh, for lexicography. And so this is an example from the Thesaurus Lingua Latina, which is a historical dictionary of Latin. And you can see the richness of what goes into the entry of the dictionary. And this is all done manually. So it's it's a result of, of years of, of study uh, where the lexicographers look, look through lots and lots of text um, instances and gather all this information in kind of relatively succinct way, of course, very rich. And um, so what I thought of uh, was, well, this is not reflecting the um, full amount of evidence that we do have for Latin, say, take a verb like advenio, for example, um, you know, there, there are thousands of occurrences in, in Latin. And so we don't get a sense of how many times this verb occurs with this meaning or with this construction or with this author from looking at the dictionary. And so computational linguistics can help us in this because we can create uh, what are called the corpus-driven lexicons, for example. So it's a kind of quantitative but computational version of a dictionary where, and it, of course, much you know, stripped down because in this case, we don't have meaning information, but we could. But um, and, and here we are ca categorizing all occurrences of a verb based on their syntactic and morphological context. So for example, we have the verb movio here uh, occurring in the active, uh, followed by an accusative in so many times, you know, this author so many times. And so this can be, can is actually the result of a systematic account of all occurrences of the verb. verb. So it, it, it mo takes away the level, um, the kind of selection level that goes on in lexico traditional lexicography, where it's a lexicographer that selects the examples to show in the dictionary, purely because there was just too little space to present them all. And it actually um, goes towards a really kind of large uh, scale um, bottom up approach. Um, and so having said, we have these two elements, the quantitative and the quality and the computational uh, thinking, well, it's natural to bring them together. So that is my third uh, pillar. So how can we doing, uh, do it together? And um, for this, I'll, I'll, I'll talk um, a little bit about a um, topic that I've been researching in the past few years. It's a, what linguists call lexical semantic change. And it's a phenomenon by which words change their meaning over time. So this is something that affects all languages, all stages. And it's interesting because it has implications, not just for linguistics, but also for digital humanities, for computational social, uh, for social sciences, um, and, and other, um, other um, areas uh, in the humanities. So um, I've collaborated with a range of different uh, people from different backgrounds on different time scales um, to investigate this um, phenomenon. How can we automatically identify the words that changed their meaning in a certain time period. So I published quite a lot on this topic. So you'll you'll you can check out my publications. I'll just give a, a couple of examples um, um, that can hopefully resonate. So this is from a um, project where we looked at UK web archives. So it's a, a couple of decades um, probably a couple of decades um, of re, uh, contemporary English. And we were able to use, uh, to identify words that had changed, particularly um, going from a kind of common sense to a computing sense, um, just purely based on um, word occurrence. So we used word embedding models and time series analysis to identify the points at which the words might have changed their meaning by basically looking at their context of usage. So for example, um, you have a word like Blackberry, um, which I would like because um, um, you, know, you can make puns about this, but um, you can clearly see that uh, up to a point um, before the Blackberry was launched, 
Um, Blackberry was associated with things like berries, basically. But then the word uh, shifted there. It's it's a usage, and you could argue that in some respects it also shifted its meaning um, when it started being used um, in the context of, of mobile phones. And similar things could be uh, done actually using even shorter time span. So this was uh, an analysis of Twitter covering 2000 and um, uh, so, so yes, sorry, five, uh, five and a half uh, years. So yes, 2012, 2017. And um, we found um, shifts that were short lived, uh, not necessarily type of changes that linguists uh, might identifies semantic change, but that um, was certainly um, you know, seen in, in, on, in, in Twitter, in Twitter jargon. So for example, Vine was a video hosting platform. So you can clearly see from the data when this word started being used in different contexts. And you can argue whether this is, again, again a lasting change in the language, but nevertheless, it is of interest not beyond linguistics, precisely because it's a symptom of um, a cultural uh, change and one that may be sh short-lived, but still, uh, are still um, uh, worth noticing, worth recording. Um, and um, these are some other examples of, of words that uh, changed, at least changed their usage. I can argue about their meaning. And we'll also um, uh, went further and use the same corpus to look at emoji. Um, so this was again, something that uh, allowed us to tackle a linguistic question, uh, specifically that of, um, you know, our emoji uh, language, do they display language features, uh, language-like features, uh, but also uh, a, a more kind of computational social science um, type of, of, of question, you know, what, what do people um, express um, and how does this change over time you know, with these, um, these emoji. And so we could see different patterns of change from periodic change to um, gradual change to no change. Um, and um, yeah, so again, this was a case in which we had a computation, so an algorithm identifying uh, patterns of change um, that could then be interpreted um, you know, in light of, of questions. So for example, we could uh, ask questions around concreteness of emoji and whether concrete versus abstract emoji have different rates of change, um, just like words. Um, so I won't go into details, but of course can discuss in, in, in the Q&A, but uh, I just want to give you a, a broad sense of, of the direction. So the pillars that I mentioned so far are you know, quite technical. So we've talked about quantitative computational and the, bringing the two together. And uh, the last one that I have is more um, about um, bit open, open thinking and open doing. Um, so that I, I think really goes hand in hand with computational thinking. See, um, open the, for open, there's actually an official definition um, that you can uh, look up in the opendefinition.org um, website. Um, and, and it basically refers to data content that is, um, you know, uh, open to anyone to uh, freely access, use, modify, and share. Uh, okay. uh, so it's it's about you know, reuse, redistribution, and universal participation. So these concepts um, you know, have been around for a while, especially in the um, open science um, landscape. It's a bit more recent that these have been uh, kind of applied and discussed in a humanities context, context. And they are closely related to publishing. Um, so the the idea of openness goes well beyond the what we imagine as you know open access publications. It goes and it applies to the whole research um, uh, process. Um, so um, in, a, in so we kind of theorize this open access pyramid where different outputs of the of the research can act together and strength, strengthen each other um, to you know in in ideally ensure a maximum reproducibility. So you have the code, you have uh, data, uh, you have papers that you know, describe the code or describe the data, and then you have the research paper building on, on this. And all of this builds on the assumption that um, the code data and, and the text is, is openly uh, published. 
And so this is, of course, not without friction and not without caveats. Um, and it's something that I've been, I've been looking uh, into in the past three years uh, since I, I started uh, my position as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Open Humanities Data, which, um, which launched a few years earlier and as, uh, an, uh, in an effort to you know, propose a new type of journal that focused on data and so published papers about data sets as opposed to um, papers um, uh, of you know, traditional research papers. So the idea goes well beyond open access um, in, to what I, I think could be we could call open humanities. So um, it's about, um, you know, just like in the sciences, we uh, try to you know, um, make the output of, of research uh, widely accessible. Uh, we could theorize a, an open humanities um, approach. And open does not just mean making uh, things open, uh, freely accessible to other academics, but also to society at large. So that is actually really uh, an important aspect that I, I think needs to be strengthened uh, in terms of participation and kind of really giving back to society. Um, so I know I'm hitting the half hour mark, so I'm just going to end with a a few flash uh, um, kind of statements about what I think uh, the future uh, could could uh, kind of, kind of could uh, have in store. So so far, I talked a lot about technical aspects and about being you know positivistic and algorithmic thinking, but there is an element of human, of course, human contribution. And I mean, this was actually already stated in the Digital Humanities Manifesto 2.0, 2011, the idea of you know, having more of a focus, not just on blindly accepting data, um, data results, but on having uh, humans in the picture. And there are a few of the aspects that are, and I'll just kind of quick, briefly touch on, but I think really my, we will uh, we'll see more of in the future. So one is, um, Kissa also mentioned this aspect of environmental, uh, sensitivity. So greening uh, research also in humanities, I think is strictly uh, kind of closely related to the computational turn and then increase the awareness of uh, the uh, impact, uh, environmental impact of the research. And so this was a piece that I took part in drafting about this. Then, of course, infrastructure is going to be even more important. I was part of this project in Living with Machines where we had, you know, huge infrastructural challenges because we had a huge amount of data that um, had particular uh, challenges in the humanities concept, context. And closely related to that is the idea of really working with uh, galleries, libraries, archives and museums uh, increasingly um, at, at, a, at a large scale because they are the equivalent, I believe, to industry for the science. Um, I'm also seeing increasingly um, visual elements going into our computational research with uh, clear implications for humanities. So just look at the ACL proceedings for this year, so a Association of Computational Linguistics, which is the state of the art of, of NLP. And you know, if you search for visual, you get quite a few hits. So research that looked into not just modeling word meaning um, via, for example, embeddings, but also in, in incorporating visual elements with you know, ideal you know, direct implications, for example, in a, in a, in a, for historical um, images. And of course, we're seeing a, a landscape uh, where new careers are emerging, been part of some efforts for um, kind of building the research software engineering um, uh, community for humanities in the UK. Uh, so new, you know, professional, relatively new professional figures that can sit alongside uh, the researchers. And finally, as always, a need for continuous development and for developing, you know, training and developing the um, the general, you know, not just the new generations, but <laughs> existing ones. Um, and just a little bit of promotion in, in a couple of weeks be. Uh, chairing a, um, a workshop on um, um, you know, pedagogical foundations in uh, in uh, computational for, for computation digital humanities. Uh, so you can look it up. Uh, this is everything for me. So thank you very much and looking forward to the questions and the discussion.